Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Kurt Wohler checking in. I appreciate you joining me for tonight's webinar. Um, just a, a few things because we are recording this. Just a heads up. Uh, I'm having internet issues on my end again. We had a problem last week. We're having thunder and lightning storms moving through, which I think is interfering at least with my computer. So what I've done is I've loaded the present the webinar, the PowerPoint presentation essentially. I converted it to a PDF. So what you're going to see is I'm going to be clicking through each page as a PDF. So there's not going to be any moving graphics. It's not going to be kind of fancy like it normally is. But at least we'll get the content out to you uh, and get it on recording. <clears throat> so tonight's presentation is titled 10 Reasons Every Individual with a Special Needs Diagnosis Should Do uh, in Organic Acids Test. Okay, a few, uh, few things up front. If you are a healthcare practitioner, physician, chiropractor, naturopath, DO, ND, nutritionist, etc., uh, Great Plains is hosting three one-day intensive seminars that I am putting on specifically on how to implement the organic acids test into clinical practice. The first seminar is coming up October. These are all on Saturdays, by the way. Saturday, October 4th in Seattle. The second one will be Saturday, December 6th in Houston, Texas. And then Saturday, February 21st in San Diego. So if you are in those regions, you know somebody in those areas, uh, you want to fly in, certainly, just go to greatplainslaboratory.com. They'll have much more information there, and you can sign up. <coughs> All right, so we're going to talk about 10 reasons why I feel every individual with a special needs diagnosis should do an organic acid test. If you've listened to my webinars over the years, you know how big I am on organic acids test, uh, testing, um, why I consider it to be one of the foundational assessments that should be done, uh, and this particular you know, presentation will kind of highlight that. So, Let's go ahead and start with reason number one, and that really has to do with the analysis for yeast toxicity. Now, if you've done an organic acids test on yourself, on your patients, on your child, you'll, this particular section should look familiar. And one of the things that we commonly see high is arabinose. Now, a lot of this goes back to the, uh, the, the, the early understanding within the integrative medicine that there's a lot of people that deal with chronic candida, candida being a specific type of yeast that can create a lot of um, problems physically, mentally, and emotionally because of the toxins that it produces. And Dr. Shaw from Great Plains Laboratory knew this as well for many years, um, but it was difficult to get direct evidence of that. You know, we, we knew patients had these issues, and we put them on an antifungal medication, and a lot of times their headache would improve, or their fatigue would improve, their skin would get better, uh, you know, their child would stop having uh, allergy issues. But there wasn't any direct evidence other than, you know, maybe picking up on a uh, yeast organism, a candida specifically, on a stool test. A lot of times treatment was initiated to see what might happen. So um, this particular article was, was released back in 1995 that actually was highlighting specific types of chemicals that were showing up in the urine um, with two brothers who had autism. As you can see here, this is a urine analysis of looking at these individual spikes. These individual spikes on this graph represent a different type of chemical that shows up in the urine. On this particular uh, present uh, slide here is of what would be considered to be a normal urine. And then we see many more spikes showing up with the two brothers with autistic characteristics. And this is a pattern that's been repeated now um, over many, many years. <clears throat> a follow-up article to that was released in 2000, which grouped many more kids on the spectrum. And particularly, they were looking at over urine samples of 211 kids um, 30 kids, which were considered to be neurotypical between the ages of 2 and 13, and then infants. And you'll notice that every one of them had some level of yeast. It's just that in the autistic kids, their level of yeast markers 
was much higher. And the yeast marker we're specifically talking about is Arabidose. Now, when you are able to detect Arabidose on an organic acid test and then treat it, in this particular case, all they did was use 10 days of Nystatin, Nystatin being a very common uh, medication for yeast, we can see that pre-test and post-test, the arabinose levels dropped off significantly. Now, there's been other indicators, you know, um, other than what Great Plains has produced or many of us in the biomedical community have produced. This was a particular um, article in the Discover magazine uh, a number of years ago that was showing a child's uh, ability to write and the legibility of that writing before they were put on an antifungal, and then approximately one month later um, after they had been on that medication for quite some time. You can see for yourself the differences are quite dramatic. So what are some of the common clinical observations that are seen with kids on the spectrum that at least appear in part related to candida overgrowth? And what I've listed here in bold uh, black is really the silliness, the goofiness, the giddiness, the inappropriate laughter, uh, parents many times describing their kids appearing drunk is a very, very characteristic sign of yeast overgrowth. Now, sometimes we see people and kids on the spectrum have intense carbohydrate and sugar cravings. Is that specifically yeast? Not always, but many times it is. Um, I do see kids a lot of times have in, in increase in sensory seeking behavior, anxiety, emotional instability, sometimes strange behavior, kids hanging upside down off, um, on furniture, seeking pressure. Um, some of these kids uh, with a heightened um, sense or a, a seeking uh, a sense of masturbation, that has been seen and sometimes correlated with, with yeast issues. The bottom line is, is that when antifungals are often used in kids on the spectrum who do show some evidence of arabinose on, on organic acids testing, improvements in focusing and concentration, improvements in language, eye contact, self-stimulatory behavior, et cetera, improve. So the bottom line to me is when we're thinking about foundational interventions and really foundational testing, the organic acids test is really top of the list for the assessment of biotoxins that candida produces and then correlating that information with a child's symptoms and clinical presentation. Now, you can do stool testing, but you know I talk to a lot of docs who do stool testing with their patients and a lot of times the stool tests come back normal and when they do the organic acids test, the, uh, the evidence of it is, is plain as, as plain as day. It's, it's, it's uh, elevated on their test and not on the stool test. Reason number two to do an organic uh, uh, do an organic acids test on an individual with a special needs diagnosis has to do with the detection of clostridia. Now these particular slides here are taken from a, a broader presentation that Dr. Shaw has done in the past um, that really discusses some of the biochemistry. Uh, that can occur. There's an excellent article that appeared in Nutritional Neuroscience in 2010 that talked about the evidence of this particular chemical, 3,3-hydroxyphenol-3-hydroxypropanoic acid, HPHPA, um, showing up elevated in urine samples of, of kids on the, individuals on the spectrum and those, um, some of them anyway, with schizophrenia. So if we take a look at what they were showing and what Dr. Shaw had found in uh, urine sampling, we noticed that the urine from an autistic child has a lot of different markers compared to a normal urine, per se. And this particular spike is related to HPHPA. Same thing. Same type of thing is seen with kids on the spectrum that we also saw with the slide with Arabinose you can see elevations or slight elevations, or at least the presence of HPHPA in many different urine samples, but you see it significantly much more elevated in kids on the spectrum, <clears throat> which indicates that Clostridia is a problematic bacteria. 
the HPHBA is coming from certain type of Clostridia bacteria. Now, Clostridia, uh, this image here of an electron uh, microscopic image of a Clostridia colony, Clostridia is a very pervasive type of bacteria. It's a strict anaerobe, which means it doesn't like oxygen. Uh, it essentially dies when it's exposed to oxygen. There's different forms of, of Clostridia. Tetanus, for example, is a Clostridia bacteria. Botulism is a Clostridia bacteria. Um, the vast majority of people aren't dealing with those two things, but they're dealing, dealing with a myriad of other types of Clostridia. Um, these things, these Clostridia form spores. These spores are highly resistant to heat. They're highly resistant to antibiotics. Uh, they're difficult to eradicate. Typically, the antibiotics that are used for Clostridia fall into two major groups, vancomycin and metronidazole. Sometimes you might get lucky using a probiotic like acidophilus, um, uh, lactobacillus aphidophilus GG, but in many cases we have to use things like uh, the, the antibiotics to get control of this particular pathogen. And unfortunately, there can be recurrences of Clostridia even after uh, long-term use of these antibiotics. Now, the spores, unfortunately, are not even killed off by common disinfectants like alcohol um, hand wipes. The only thing that's actually been known to kill spores is bleach. And um, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that some people feel that maybe what's happening with some of the kids who are getting benefit from the chlorine dioxide uh, therapy, or it's called CD, used to be called MMS, is perhaps the, uh, the CD is killing off, in part, the Clostridia spores. So the other difficulty with Clostridia is carriers. So you can, you can carry Clostridia and not have symptoms. And this is one of the reasons that I've commonly, over the years, suggested to the family members with a child on the spectrum who has recurrent problems with Clostridia is to also get the rest of the family tested as well, to at least minimally do an organic acids test to see if their um, HP, HPA levels are high. There's a number of different Clostridia that produce HP, HPA. As we can see here on this particular slide, uh, these, what, six or seven Clostridia are known to produce HP, HPA. Um, these particular type of Clostridia don't. Now, this doesn't necessarily indicate that these particular Clostridia are benign. As you can see, Clostridia tetani is on this list. Uh, we know what kind of problem that can create. There's potentially other pathogenic and problematic toxins that these may produce um, that, you know, in some part may not be clearly understood at this point. So one of the things on the organic acid test you'll see is an elevated HPHPA level. This particular sample here is quite high. I'm going to talk about shortly the chemicals called HVA and VMA. Oftentimes when you find HPHPA levels high, you'll see the HVA, HVA level also elevated. And, uh, Let's talk about that right now. One of the reasons that happens has to do with a biochemical a blocking effect of HPHPA. If we come up here to the left-hand side of this uh, slide, we'll see DOPA, okay? Or, and we come over here on the other side down here. I wish I had a pointer. I don't. Um, at the bottom of the graph, we see norepinephrine. DOPA essentially converts into dopamine. And through dopamine, through this specific enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylate, it's converted to norepinephrine. So we should have a good balance between these two. Essentially, excess dopamine gets broken down into homovanillic acid, or HVA. And then norepinephrine can be directly converted into epinephrine or by um, as a byproduct be converted into VMA. So on the organic acids test, they're not only measuring HVA and VMA, they're also measuring the specific clostridium markers of HPHPA. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that HPHPA inhibits dopamine beta hydroxylase. So through the presence of HPHPA, we can block the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is very important for attention and focusing. 
um, higher cognitive abilities. Dopamine is very important for mood. Um, dopamine is uh, important for you know, cognitive function as well. <clears throat> so we can see that HPHPA blocks that conversion. Now, one of the problems in having too much dopamine or not enough norepinephrine is you create a neurochemical imbalance. Essentially here, there's an overlap in the way these neurochemicals work, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. We're not having a direct impact on serotonin, per se, with clostridia, but you know, potentially indirectly um, with added stress in the, in the system and through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis stimulation, you could theorize that serotonin may, event, may over time become imbalanced as well. But if we just keep our attention focused on dopamine and norepinephrine, Dopamine is very much uh, involved in mood and cognitive function. It itself is involved in attention overlapping with norepinephrine. Um, and, <clears throat> but when it's imbalanced, there can be very much be uh, an increase in dopamine, which can lead to a lot of the self-stimulatory behavior, anxiety issues, and in extreme cases, aggressive behavior, self-injurious behavior. Norepinephrine you know, it has a relationship with mood and cognitive function as well as attention. It's very much involved in alertness and concentration and energy production, but you start to have imbalances in that and you create problems um, with over, you know, hyperexcitability, etc. Certainly if we're not making enough norepinephrine too, alertness and concentration can be impaired. Well, it turns out that there's another toxin that clostridia can produce. And this particular toxin comes from clostridia difficile. Now, clostridia difficile is in the news a lot lately because of its uh, serious nature with respects to inflammatory bowel disease, how resistant it is to treatment, uh, and how difficult it is to eradicate. Well, it turns out that C. difficile, amongst all the other problems it creates, it also produces a compound called uh, uh, for creosol, okay, and this is the, the chemical reaction or conversion of forming for creosol. Why is for creosol a problem? Well, it turns out that for creosol, just like HPHBA, inhibits dopamine beta hydroxylase, therefore blocking dopamine to norepinephrine conversion, getting a relative rise in dopamine, too much dopamine, and the spillover effect into HBA has severe consequences for many individuals on the spectrum. One of the problems with an excess dopamine is many of the byproducts that it produces. When you get excess dopamine production, um, <clears throat> that excess dopamine can um, act as an antioxidant, or excuse me, as an, as an oxidative stress in the nervous system. So it can put added stress in the brain, uh, creating more oxidative stress and then when we have a problem with oxidative stress, we're tending to use up a lot of our glutathione reserves. <clears throat> so it can not only create oxidative stress, it can create neurodegeneration long term. One of the things that excess dopamine, or a couple of things that excess dopamine does as well, is it substitutes itself into the nervous system instead of norepinephrine, and this tends to overactivate the sympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system is overstressed, uh, the fight or flight response initiates, and that creates a whole cascade of events of anxiety and hyper uh, excitability and self-injurious behavior. Uh, you can see where this uh, discussion could tend to go. Also, excess dopamine is very damaging um, to the cells itself. It tends to deplete glutathione in the cells. We, are, we know that chemically many kids on the spectrum tend to be depleted of glutathione. So there's not much good that comes when dopamine uh, is in an excess amount long term. Now when certain medications like metronidazole are used, a lot of times you'll see a dramatic drop in HBHBA and oftentimes you'll see that improvement um, in the clinical outlook for a particular child as well, where they were aggressive, where they were hyperstimulated, where they were self-injurious, that diminishes with the reduction of HPHPA. So to me, the organic acid test is a critical test to do 
to not only assess for yeast, but also to assess for clostridia. The third reason of doing an organic acid test for an individual with special needs is trying to prioritize what do you treat first, yeast or bacteria. <clears throat> Well, if we think about treatment considerations for both, we can sort of list things in specific categories. The sort of textbook presentation I mentioned before about yeast, self-stimulatory behavior, carbohydrate, sugar cravings, silliness, goofiness, giddiness, inappropriate laughter. Okay, that sort of textbook presentation. Clostridia behavior is often agitated, aggressive, biting, kicking, screaming, uh, headbanging in extreme situations. Sometimes you get a blurred picture. Sometimes you get a mixture of these things. Uh, and it's not always easy to decipher what's going on unless you have the test data to kind of help support um, what it is you're seeing behaviorally. So um, the organic acids test helps to prioritize. And I've often said over the years that, you know, Yeast is certainly a big problem for kids on the spectrum. However, before we automatically jump in and start treating yeast or everything that we, we think is yeast related, it's really important to get this test to make sure clostridia is not an issue. Now let's talk about a specific case that relates to this. Case number one is a, of a specific um, boy, five years old, at the first time of his visit, uh, at the first time of his visit, you know, uh, he was at f he was five years old, and his di official diagnosis was autism. His developmental history: there was no pregnancy complications. He had a little bit of colic as an infant. Typical development to about ten months. Um, his parents did report that he seemed to lack, you know, a, a lot of need for physical contact. But you know, other than that, you know, he breastfed for a year, and um, then they transitioned to cow dairy, you know, solids around six months. Um, you know, nothing really jumped out, so to speak. But, you know, around 10 to 11 months, they did start to notice that eye contact started to disappear. However, he was still playful and happy, uh, and he was engaging with his siblings. Physical milestones were fine. He was babbling. Uh, unfortunately, never any, never wor words never really fully developed. Um, but they didn't really have any major red flags that they were real concerned about, until about 15 months when they notified the pediatrician of their concerns regarding language. They were encouraged to wait a little bit longer and just kind of see how things progressed. Now, from a medical history standpoint, you know, multiple ear infections during those first two years, the parents commented it always seemed like he was on antibiotics. Digestive-wise, he tended to have hard stools the first year and into the second year. And sometimes they need to use a suppository to kind of get things going. Around 18 months, he developed an intestinal infection. He had fever and diarrhea for about three days. He was given multiple doses of Tylenol to suppress the fever. No antibiotics were given. Uh, and the pediatrician felt that it was viral. About two weeks after that fever and diarrhea, he seemed to become more irritable and agitated. And there was a, a, a drop. Um, in, uh, in his appetite. He just didn't have a normal appetite like he did before. About 20 months, he seemed to disappear. And in quotes here, this is kind of what the parents are indicating. So <clears throat> he had no expressive language. Well, he had language delay prior. Poor social interaction, not interested in sibling or even the neighbor kids anymore. So he was regressing. Uh, he became easily agitated with side glancing while standing close to the TV screen, hand flapping, finger twisting. Um, he just became much more fixated on these types of behaviors as opposed to being socially engaged. The pediatrician referred to a neurologist for evaluation. The neurologist ran a fragile X test, which was normal, stated there was nothing he could do, and he was autistic, and they sort of went off and fended for themselves. Some states that you know you can get you know resource center help, speech, ABA, uh, but a lot of parents kind of are off, kind of fighting this battle on their own. So they started doing some research on their own and learned about biomedical intervention and started to try some things themselves. They initiated a casein-free diet, which almost immediately helped improve eye contact. He started to sleep through the night um, within about two weeks. 
They didn't notice much of a change with the gluten-free diet. They tried some probiotics. It helped his stools and his mood. They started a multivitamin, kind of made him hyper, so they stopped that about three weeks later. So for the most part, overall, for the next year, things seem to stabilize regarding his autism and his overall physical health. At about age four, he developed an upper respiratory infection and was given, again, some antibiotics. Within the week of completing the treatment, he became unusually agitated and aggressive. Um, he was hitting, screaming, scratching, and biting, and was just not consolable. Behavior was on and off for a couple weeks, but it never fully went away. So the parents started initiating some, some remedies on their own, eye contact, less behavior. Grape fisted extract, by the way, is something that's commonly given for bacterial and yeast issues. So <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm presenting this case is that we can't just assume that all of these behaviors are related to yeast. Sometimes you can get lucky when you give an antifungal and those types of situations improve. Remember, he had a lot of self-stimulatory behavior um, looking at the TV set, doing these kinds of things, and sometimes that can improve with uh, antifungals. However, what commonly happens if clostridia is present as well um, is the situation can get worse. The grape fusid extract, the probiotics, the herbal remedies tend to, tend to diminish the yeast, but if you've got clostridia sitting there, uh, things can get worse. And in this particular case, he had a problem where uh, I believe he had an underlying clostridia issue that got worse when given antibiotics. Um, <clears throat> and the clostridia got worse as the natural bacteria died off. So we ran an organic acid test, and sure enough, his HPHPA level was significantly high at 700, and his HVA level was very high. So we knew that in part the HPHPA was inhibiting the dopamine beta hydroxylase uh, and he was getting an excess production of dopamine. So flagell or metronidazole was initiated for 10 days. In this particular case, we also put him on some nystatin to deal with yeast and uh, put him on some culturel as well uh, because culturel is helpful against clostridia. Within five days into the flagell treatment, the aggression and irritability disappeared. Within about three weeks, he was more happy, content, and playful. And the parents continued with the GSCF diet and probiotics. There was definitely improvements overall in his cognitive gains. Uh, this was one of those cases where I definitely wanted a repeat out to confirm, but they just sort of lost a follow-up. But uh, it's an important lesson in the fact that what uh, a lot of people will attribute to yeast or maybe a dietary infraction or anxiety um, can be, uh, you know, as the main problem if you don't look for the clostridia and look at the conversion of HVA, uh, HVA reactivity off the organic acid test, it's easy to miss. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about oxalates. This is number four on my list of why individuals with a special needs diagnosis should do an organic acid test. Oxalates are organic compounds found in many different types of foods and healthy foods you know, with that. But oxalates can also be a problem for some people in the fact that too many oxalates can accumulate in the body and cause crystals that in severe cases can cause kidney stones, but in other cases can either deposit into joints, into connected tissue, in the muscles, and just cause pain and discomfort. Some common patient complaints and really clinical observations of individuals with oxalate issues many times I'll talk to parents about a sandy or grainy appearing stool. Certainly bladder irritability can be an issue, and I'll talk to parents about the fact does it look like their child is having a difficult time urinating? Is it painful when they're urinating? Um, so they know oxalates can cause urethral irritation, vulvar pain. Matter of fact, uh, a specific type of condition called uh, vulvodynia is commonly associated with oxalates. And in many women with vulvodynia, uh, the onset of the vulvodynia happened after a vaginal yeast infection. Eye pain, eye poking in children can be associated with oxalates. That can also be associated with a calcium deficiency too. 
body aches, burning feelings in muscles, fibromyalgia-like discomfort, moodiness, irritability, aggressive behavior, um, has, is often seen in autism with oxalates. So we can't attribute moodiness, irritability, and aggressive behavior all to clostridia. Again, the organic acid test helps to identify the oxalate levels as well as the clostridia. And then tendon pain, et cetera, can show up with oxalate issues. So there's another case of a, of a young autistic individual, seven years old, at the first time of their presentation to me. And the parents' primary issues were was no expressive language, poor social skills, a lot of self-stimulatory behavior. Behaviorally, could be very emotionally volatile, easily upset, aggressive, hitting himself. Uh, and one of the things that was most concerning was would essentially would scream and run through the house holding his penis and pressing his groin against the ground or furniture. Now, this wasn't going on all the time, but it would tend to cycle in and cycle out you know, on a repetitive basis um, every so often. Digestion-wise, it tended to fluctuate between loose stools and formed. Many times you see a lot of undigested food in the stool, and then the sandy substance at time would show up. The main physical finding was abdominal distension, some of these kids that look like they were pregnant. And then what's happened with lab testing over the times is just these fluctuating levels of HPHPA would be treated with culturel, various herbs, um, flagell antibiotics, uh, and things would improve you know, over time. And as we kind of step back and look through some samples of organic acid tests um, with respects to the clostridium markers, we'll notice that you know, the HP, HP level, A levels were not always high. Uh, matter of fact, going back to 2011, 2012, uh, again, later 2012, the levels would tend to come and go. However, he was a kid that tended to respond to flagell treatment and had the, the simple characteristics of, you know, having clostridia. <clears throat> but my suspicion was there was something else that was uh, a problem for him. Um, back in 2013, we can see the HPA levels quite high. Uh, and again, in February of 2014, after being treated, he would just tend to cycle in and out of clostridia issues, which would then tend to coincide with his uh, aberrant behavior. But as we step back, and these are things that we had discussed during consultation, was I also knew that this kid was dealing with not just clostridia, uh, was also dealing with oxalates. But you know, the low oxalate diet can be a challenge in many cases. And so it's, it's not always easily implemented. But if we look back and go back and look at you know, the 2011 test, oxalates were high. Again in 2012 in January. And again in February, the oxalate levels continued to be high. Eventually, um, it was worked out and he was put on a low oxalate diet uh, and started to do you know, quite well, <clears throat> even despite the fact that in some cases he still tended to have either slightly elevated or high normal uh, HPHPA levels. This is a particular kid where really uh, I felt it was both situations occurring. So you'll notice on this particular test, if I drop back, and let's go back and take a look at December 2nd, 2012, he had an oxalate level of 223. Prior to that, it was 234. Prior to that, it was 241. As we come forward to June of 2013, his level was 185, just at the cutoff. Okay, But he could still be having some issues here. But it's diminishing, which is fantastic. I then come back in November, excuse me, October 5th, 2013, is now 127. Back in February of 2014, they got the test back. And sure enough, it showed up high again. We're trying to figure out what's going on because he was actually doing quite well. Well, it turned out that on the, the age bracket, he was listed as an 85-year-old man, which the lab shifted his reference range to show that he was high. However, if you put that number back into the appropriate reference range, it had been the lowest number we had seen to that date. So the, the, the 
low oxalate diet can be a, a godsend for many kids with high oxalates. Some common foods with, that are high in oxalates, soy and soy products, berries, nuts, and spinach. Um, so if you have questions about the low oxalate diet, you can go to lowoxalate.info and learn more about it. And, um, you know, particularly if you think this is something that has uh, some, um, some relevance for your child. Well, what about reason number five? Reason number five on the list of why to do an organic acid test is evaluating for mitochondrial dysfunction. <clears throat> this has been something that has been looked at now over the past number of years. A lot of good articles about this. And definitely some insight that a number of kids in the spectrum are dealing with a mitochondrial problem. But there is a difference between a mitochondrial disease versus a mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, it was mitochondrial diseases were really once thought to be rare and uh, are now considered to be one of the most common metabolic problems in kids. Um, some cases of mitochondrial diseases can occur in autism, usually brought on by you know, genetic abnormalities or abnormalities in the metabolic mechanisms of the mitochondria itself. However, the vast majority of kids in the spectrum are not dealing with a mitochondrial disease. Um, in some cases, these diseases can be quite severe. Heart defects, brain abnormalities, seizures, strokes, you know, uh, limb weakness, poor musculoskeletal development. So what we're seeing with kids in the spectrum for the vast majority of cases is not a disease, it is more of a dysfunction or what you could say possibly is, a, is sort of a functional imbalance that is often brought about by other things. <clears throat> Yeast toxins, bacterial toxins, nutritional deficiencies can all lead to a dysfunction, but it's not an inherent disease process. The mitochondria are these little energy factories in our cells, and they kick out a particular chemical called ATP. And ATP, think of it as a cellular currency of what our cells use as energy. One of the mechanisms that's involved in mitochondrial function is the Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle. One of the things that gets evaluated off the organic acids test is different regions uh, or different markers of the Krebs cycle itself. And it turns out that some of those markers can actually be negatively influenced by yeast toxins, um, I've seen mitochondrial dysfunction occur because of oxalate issues, certainly nutritional issues, possibly heavy metals. It's not always just one thing, but many times uh, a number of things. <clears throat> so what are some of the things that you know, we might see in autism that could be related to a mitochondrial dysfunction? Well, certainly cognitive and language issues poor digestive function, weakened immunity, uh, a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation. Are those specifically linked to mitochondrial dysfunctions? Not necessarily, but I think it's safe to say that you know, when you've got a number of things going on in a child, from food sensitivities to heavy metals to bacterial to yeast problems, their mitochondria are, at some level are going to be affected. Now, there's a number of researchers that have speculated that many of the problems um, in autism that may be environmentally induced um, could be coming from, you know, outside chemicals, pesticides, PCBs, certainly heavy metal toxicities. We know that in some individuals, vaccine reactions can be a trigger for mitochondrial dysfunction. But we also have to look inside. And one of the reasons the organic acid test is so helpful is to identify uh, internal toxins. Again, clostridia. There is a, a, a chemical called propanoic acid that can be produced that is a known toxin to mitochondria. Anything that affects the methylation cycle, oxidative stress and glutathione depletion, like we talked about with dopamine excess, that could impact the mitochondria. And then certainly nutrient imbalances that might come about can affect mitochondrial function. So it's certainly possible that you know, more kids that are being tested for 
have mitochondrial issues that tend to either resolve once you start working on things biomedically um, <clears throat> um, or, you know, uh, change over time um, by things like diet and, and uh, reducing oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a big one because oxidative stress is going to impact a lot of cellular function throughout the body. So, you know, as all the things that are going on, oxidative stress is really at the heart of some of the, the, the problems that occur um, at the cellular level. And this is why so many kids are put on supplements like vitamin C or glutathione or vitamin E, is to try to improve the oxidative stress levels in the body. Okay, there are some biomarkers that can be done off of other testing that can indicate mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, doing blood testing um, is something that uh, is necessary for a lot of, a lot of kids. So if you've got elevated lactic acid, elevated ammonia, um, an elevated pyruvate on a blood test, that can be suggestive of a mitochondrial issue. Low carnitine on a blood test can be suggestive of a mitochondrial problem. <clears throat> One of the nice things, though, about the organic acid test is that you also are picking up on those Krebs cycle markers as well as analyzing for things like lactic acid and pyruvate. So <clears throat> some of the things that are done through blood testing can actually be analyzed through the organic acid test. And my feeling is if you're going to do one test, the OAT is great because it could really be a screening test for mitochondrial dysfunction. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't go off and maybe do other tests, but for the most part, you're going to get really good data off the OAT test to kind of give you an idea do I need to do further testing or not? So <clears throat> the OAT is great for that. Now, if you're looking at mitochondrial disease, that's a much more involved process. Um, there's really no gold standard test for mitochondrial diseases. They have to look at different genetic tests, doing muscle biopsy assessment for certain problems. But again, statistically, you know, for the vast majority of kids on the spectrum, it's a mitochondrial dysfunction, not a disease that can easily be analyzed off the organic acid test. All right, reason number six for doing an OAT, uh, organic acid test for individuals with special needs, has to do with neurotransmitter assessment. If we go back and think about how clostridia affects the function of dopamine conversion to norepinephrine, and we know that HPHPA and 4-creosol inhibit the dopamine beta hydroxylase. Uh, this is a little bit more insight into that. Remember, HVA is linked to dopamine. VMA is linked to norepinephrine. And again, we come back to this chart. HPA, 4-creosol, all coming from different clostridia bacteria, inhibiting dopamine beta hydroxylase, a relative rise in dopamine, an increase in HBA, uh, with a, a blocking effect of norepinephrine. And this is just plays out when you now cross-correlate HPA levels with HBA and VMA levels uh, over time. And this is in a, a particular individual with autism. As the HPA levels go up, so do the dopamine levels, but the VMA levels don't go up so much because why? We're blocking that converting enzyme. Now, it's not, you know, these tests don't just have usefulness with individuals on the spectrum. These are often done for individuals with mental health problems as well. And this is a particular slide showing organic acid testing for depression. We see the HVA HPHPA level extremely high at 999, and we see the HVA level significantly elevated, uh, you know, excess dopamine related to the ratio here. And after treatment, his depression is resolved, clostridium marker is down, and HPA level has now normalized. So one of the things about the nervous system 
and the importance of understanding how some of these chemicals relate you know, has to do with what's called the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, when it is overactivated, is that fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system is also important, but it tends to have more of a, an effect at, you know, regulating heart rate and improving digestion and uh, relaxing uh, the lungs, um, you know, helping with, with bladder control. So it, it's sort of like we have the accelerator and the brake as part of our autonomic nervous system. Dopamine in excess ends up incorporating itself into those norepinephrine pathways and just constantly pushing, pushing on the, the accelerator, which tends to rev up that sympathetic nervous system and rev up that fight or flight response. So again, HVA is neurochemically linked to dopamine. VMA is neurochemically linked to norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, and the elevation of these two markers is often seen you know, with mental emotional, anxiety and fear, hyperactivity, physical pain, infections and food sensitivities can be an added stress on the system, and then HVA being directly elevated with respects to clostridium markers. Okay. So reason seven for doing an organic acid test on special needs individual has to do with certain chemicals such as serotonin and particularly one we're going to talk about here called quinolinic acid. Now tryptophan is an important amino acid in the body because it fits itself right into the pathway for serotonin production. We know that serotonin is important for melatonin production, serotonin is important for mood. Um, it's also important for learning, fine and gross motor skills. Many people who have chronic stress, chronic you know, excess cortisol production over years end up depleting serotonin. Um, certainly uh, serotonin can be linked uh, to depression and certainly severe depression. Well, it turns out that this is a pretty complex pathway. And when we take serotonin as a supplement, that serotonin is converted into a chemical called 5-HT, which be, um, essentially becomes active serotonin. But serotonin can also be converted through what's called the kynorenic pathway into quinolinic acid. And quinolinic acid serves a purpose. Uh, it's involved in helping to regulate bacteria and viruses and parasites. But when quinolinic acid becomes too high, it can overstimulate the nervous system and in itself damage brain cells. And there's two different enzymes that actually help with the conversion of tryptophan to quinolinic acid. Cortisol, excess cortisol and stress can activate the tryptophan 2,3-dioxygenase. And you know, uh, uh, yeast, fungal proteins, as well as the immune system can activate another converting enzyme, endolamine 2,3-dioxygenase. So either way, through stress, chronic infection, chronic yeast, um, chronic you know, cortisol production, we're taking tryptophan and shuttling it to quinolinic acid. Now, why is that an issue? Well, it turns out that tryptophan is certainly an important amino acid in the brain because of the pathways that it can go down. Certainly, we want it to feed that, that serotonin pathway as much as possible. Now, tryptophan nutritionally, when it's combined with many other amino acids, can easily be blocked from entering the brain. Matter of fact, uh, people who consume a very high protein diet oftentimes can run into problems where tryptophan is running at a deficit because what are called large neutral amino acids like tyrosine and phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, valine, methionine can compete with tryptophan at the blood-brain barrier and block it from being absorbed. One of the ways of getting tryptophan increased into the brain is by using tryptophan um, with a high carbohydrate diet. And this is probably why a lot of people get addicted to um, high carbohydrate foods is because they're getting a relative increase of tryptophan and they're getting some of that conversion into serotonin. And it may be one reason why so many obese people tend to choose a low protein diet is because they're getting that fix 
of tryptophan to serotonin conversion. Well, tryptophan as a supplement has been controversial. For many years, tryptophan was not available in the United States without a prescription. And it had to do with a condition called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. And it was always suspected that it wasn't the tryptophan itself, but the fact that a batch of tryptophan was contaminated. And that contaminated batch was sold, consumed, and many people developed this severe uh, eosinophilic um, uh, problem. And so the FDA came in and regulated tryptophan and for a long time took it off the market. And that's when 5-HTP kind of caught fire. 5-hydroxytryptophan is a supplement, 5-HTP, that can be taken in place of tryptophan. And the nice thing is, is 5-hydroxytryptophan does not convert to quinolinic acid, whereas tryptophan itself, or L-tryptophan, can. Now, 5-HTP uh, can cause some drowsiness, um, and it's been, but it has been used for sleep problems as well as depression. So a lot of times when I give 5-HTP, I'll often have people start it at night um, to see what kind of effect they get because I know it can cause drowsiness. So one of the things that is important about the organic acids test is to not just arbitrarily use tryptophan supplementation in autism. Because what you'll find is some of the kids actually have elevated quinolinic acid. And the problem with that is, potentially, is if you give tryptophan as an individual supplement, you could end up worsening the quinolinic acid problem. The quinolinic acid goes higher. And remember, quinolinic acid will overstimulate the brain cells uh, itself is known to be damaging in high amounts to brain cells, and that's the last thing we want to happen. And so that's one of the reasons that I personally tend to avoid tryptophan in many cases, unless I've got some kind of confirmation that the organic acid test is saying that the quinolinic acid levels are okay. I, but uh, for the most part, you can get the job done by using 5-HTP. <clears throat> Uh, and this was just another slide talking about the possibility of uh, another type of disorder being associated with, with tryptophan, uh, and that had to do with scleroderma uh, and uh, excess eosinophil production. So my recommendation would be to just avoid arbitrarily giving you know, tryptophan in, you know, as, a, as an extra supplement uh, if you are going to try to boost serotonin levels, I think it, personally I think it's better to use 5-HTP uh, unless you've got confirmation off the organic acid test that quinolinic acid levels are okay. Okay, so we're going to kind of run through here and wrap things up uh, for 8, 9, and 10. One of the other reasons that I like the organic acid test is to get an assessment of things called pyrimidines. And pyrimidines are important because the, the two that are being tested for, uracil and thymine, are specifically involved in <clears throat> the, the building blocks of DNA. And why this is important is because they are directly reflective of folate status. Remember, folate is linked to folic acid. But folate can be converted into L-methylfolate, which is the active form involved in the methylation cycle. And so if we have a problem where some of these, the, either uracil or thymine is high, it can indicate that we're not getting adequate amount of folate in the diet, and supplementation can be worthwhile. And anytime that's the case with inefficient folate, it's going to have an impact on the methylation cycle. The methylation cycle has an impact on attention and focusing and language, environmental awareness. It all links back to that whole methylation biochemistry. So <clears throat> that particular, this particular test gives us some insight uh, into that. Also, by the way, you know, you'll notice um, Many of these markers, when they're elevated on the organic acids test for the, the wide variety, um, for a number of kids, they might be slightly high. 
and that just indicates that we've got some kind of nutritional issue going on with folate. These numbers have to be extremely high in order to indicate that there's really some kind of genetic or metabolic disease process, which is just something that, in my experience, I don't see. I don't want to say that it never occurs, but what I've seen in my practice is, you know, the vast majority of these tests, the markers are slightly elevated, which indicates more of a nutritional imbalance as opposed to a true genetic or metabolic disease problem. Reason number nine is a, is a quick assessment of certain nutrients. We can get an idea of B12 deficiency, get an idea of ascorbic acid or vitamin C deficiency uh, that can show up on the organic acids test. Um, pyridoxic acid, vitamin B6, panathenic acid, vitamin B5 um, can be indicated as nutritional markers off of this particular test. Sometimes when the tests come back, you'll see that some of these B, uh, B vitamin markers are slightly high, and that can occur just with supplementation. That doesn't mean it's a problem. It just means that you know, we're, we're taking the supplement and hopefully getting some benefit from it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's toxic per se. And then other nutritional markers off the organic, looking at N-acetylcysteine. Uh, N-acetylcysteine is linked directly to glutathione production. CoQ10 is important for mitochondrial function. Biotin deficiencies are important for connective tissue and, and, and skin, uh, skin healing and growth. Biotin can also be depleted when oxalates are high. And then finally, reason number 10 is to evaluate for glutathione production. <clears throat> There's a number of markers on the organic acid test that give an idea of stress within the detoxification system, particularly glutathione. And research has shown over the years that many kids on the spectrum are just either depleted in glutathione, they don't have very good stores, or they have biochemically have a difficult time making or, um, enough glutathione to keep up with the oxidative stress that may be going on. So the organic acid test has some markers for that uh, as an indicator of detoxification stress. <clears throat> it also has a specific marker on there that kind of gives some insight into other chemicals, whether it's you know aspartame con consumption, salicylate consumption. So you can get some insight in there to see if there is anything in your child's diet that may be impacting things negatively from a biochemical standpoint. OK, so that is the top 10 reasons that I believe and feel very strongly that the organic acids test should be done as a primary test for any individual with a special needs, whether it's a child, teenager, or adult, because there's a ton of information you can get from it. <clears throat> and it's one of the first tests that I do in my practice and have done so for many, many years. There's a number of other resources that I have that you may find helpful. Um, there's a number of books that I've written. This particular book called Autism, uh, The Road to Recovery, has case studies, lab recommendations, talks about methyl B12, supplements, et cetera. Um, you can find that at autismrecoverybook.com. <clears throat> I also have a very interactive website. This is a subscription website where people just join month to month. There's no long-term contracts. It's $37 a month. And you can ask questions. There's protocols. There's videos. There's a parent forum where people post questions on a daily basis, even post questions to me privately. I'm on this website uh, daily, uh, whether it's you know troubleshooting an issue, looking at a link for a supplement, um, you know, hey doc, you know, what's this behavior all about? Uh, those are the types of things I try to help people with through uh, AutismActionPlan.com. And then we have some a new site. This is called Lab Test Plus. This is a place that you can actually now access. Uh, things like the organic acid test or the food IgG test or uh, stool testing. Uh, we have testing for uh, adrenal hormones. Uh, there's new tests that we're adding all the time. So you can go to Lab Test Plus and learn more about the, the integrative medicine tests that are offered through here. Uh, if there's a question about a test 
or maybe there's a question about which test would be appropriate for my situation or my child's situation, we do the best we can to kind of help answer those. Uh, and you can access that through the site as well. Matter of fact, there's an area called which test where you can go to that section and you can submit a question. Uh, we have videos about what all these tests are for. Uh, we've also added a new section on uh, articles that explain the test. We're adding a new section for test panel recommendations. So, you know, test panel recommendations for ADHD, test panel recommendations for autism, test panel recommendations for depression or fibromyalgia. So uh, it's a very uh, useful website and a lot of information there. So you can go to labtestplus.com. The other nice benefit about the labs that come through Lab Test Plus is that with the test, you will also get a written interpretation that is more than what the lab itself provides. So more clinical insight into what some of these markers indicate. And that, that's part of the, uh, the service from the labs ordered from this site. And then, of course, you can always find out more information about me. My main website is drwoller.com. And then if you're interested in consultations, uh, I do phone, um, internet, as well as in-person consults. Uh, you can contact my pr practice manager at 951-461-4800 or email to info at mysunrisecenter.com. And then finally, if you came on late and you are a practitioner and you want to learn more about how to implement the organic acid test into your practice, not just for autism, but for a wide variety of other patients, then uh, I encourage you to uh, join me on either Saturday, October 4th in Seattle, Saturday, December 6th in Houston, Texas, or Feb Saturday, February 21st in San Diego, California. So I hope this presentation was helpful for everybody. If you did happen to post a question, uh, those questions will be submitted to me through email from Great Plains. Uh, I usually get them in the next couple days and it may take me a few days to answer, uh, but we'll get that information back to you. Uh, and this presentation was recorded as well, so this will be available for listening in the future. So everybody, enjoy your evening. I appreciate you joining me tonight, and we will see you next time. Thanks so much.